911. What's the location of the emergency? My my daughter is missing. She's gone. We can't find her anywhere. I've called all her friends. How old is she? Eleven. Okay. What's her name, ma'am? Carly. C A R L I E. Her last name? Brucia. B R U C I A. Viewer discretion is advised for this educational documentary. We should all feel comfortable and safe walking down the street, regardless of our age, gender or any other element of who we are, if only that were the case. Today's video is yet another example of one bad person taking that feeling of security, that feeling of confidence that we and those that we love will be okay when simply going about our lives. Instead, they cast doubt and fear in our minds. This is the extremely sad story of Carly Brucher. Welcome or welcome back to Dark Case Documentaries. I bring you true crime, disturbing stories and other things that you may later regret knowing with regular uploads every week. Please do join the quickly growing Dark Case family by hitting subscribe now and turning on notifications. Thank you so much for choosing to be here with me. Our love and respect goes out to those that knew and loved Carly. Carly Brucher was born on the 16th of March 1992. She resided with her mother Susan and stepfather Steve in Sarasota, Florida. Even though the family was separated, Carly was very close to both her parents. She frequently visited her birth father in Long Island, New York. Carly, now in sixth grade, was a smart girl and always attended school. She achieved high grades and was even voted maths whiz in fifth grade. She was also a Girl Scout and sang in the chorus at school. As soon as Carly learnt to read and write, she began writing stories, sat at her desk, gifted to her by her father. Carly was also active and liked to skateboard when and where she could. Those who knew her said she was a friendly and considerate child. She was described as being joyful and always smiling by her family. Now 11 years old, on February the 1st, 2004, it was Super Bowl Sunday. Carly was still at her friend Danielle's house after a sleepover the night before. However, she wanted to go back to her mother's place before the game started. Carly decided to walk back home because it was only around a mile away, a distance that could be walked in around 20 minutes. As Carly left her friend Danielle's house at around 6pm, Danielle's mother phoned Susan, Carly's mother, to let her know Carly was on her way. Susan, not really liking the idea of Carly walking home alone, asked stepfather Steve to drive the route that Carly was walking and pick her up to bring her home. As Steve drove, he was speaking with Susan on the phone the whole time, and what started off as a normal conversation soon escalated into a panic. Carly wasn't where she should have been. She was nowhere to be seen as he drove the route to Danielle's house. He returned home hoping that somehow he had just missed her. But when he got back, sadly she wasn't there. She wasn't anywhere to be found. Carly's mother dialed 911. Susan reported that Carly had gone missing. 911, what's the location of the emergency? My, my daughter is missing. What's your address, ma'am? And your phone number? Okay. Has she been missing before? No. She had a fight with her girlfriend. She decided to walk home. And we've been driving around for about an hour and a half. Uh -huh. And now um, it's now an hour and a half walk. She's gone. We can't find her anywhere. I've called all her friends. How old is she? Eleven. And when was the last time that she was she was seen? It was at six o'clock, Jean. Around six o'clock. And she was at a friend's house? Yeah. Okay, what's her name, ma'am? Carly, C-A-R-L-I-E. Her last name? Brucia, B-R-U-C-I-A. She's too shy of my feet. Okay. Do you know how much she weighs? She's over 120 pounds. Okay, what color hair does she have? Dirty blonde. And what color eyes? Blue. 
Police quickly showed up to the house to begin investigating. Other officers went to friend Danielle's house to gather more information. Police put out a bolo or a be on the lookout for Carly. A bolo is used to put officers on high alert for anyone matching the description given. However, things sadly weren't that simple. There was no sign of Carly that night at all, nor would her friends see her the following morning at school. The search for Carly was ramped up and police used scent dogs to begin their hunt. The dogs followed the scent taken from Carly's pillowcase to a car wash off Bee Ridge Road. The dogs had locked onto Carly's scent. She had been there. They took officers through the parking lot and to the back of the car wash. There, the scent trail went cold. Attending officers also discovered CCTV cameras during their search of the location. There were cameras facing the parking lot and the rear of the car wash. The cameras and the scent trail crossed paths. This would lead to the first major breakthrough in the case. Car wash owner Mike Evanoff looks at tape from his surveillance cameras. I just came in and saw um, her walking and him walking and it's just uh, right away right when I saw it, it just threw uh, chills and chills and shivers right in my body. Police accessed the surveillance tapes and skipped back to around the time that Carly left her friend's house, 6pm. The footage from the camera that covered the front parking lot didn't show anything of interest. The camera that covered the rear of the car wash was motion activated. At 6.21pm, the camera started recording. This is that footage. Carly is seen strolling through the parking lot in her red t-shirt and jeans, when a stocky white male with dark hair and average height approaches her. After being grabbed, you can make out a look of concern on Carly's face. She knows this isn't right. Carly is led by the man out of the view of the camera. Police were dumbfounded by how brazen this abduction was, but they now had more to work with to bring Carly home. The people closest to Carly were questioned by the police. Cases like this can often be solved simply by investigating those that knew the victim. Steve, Carly's stepfather, was interrogated. However, the fact that he was on the phone with Susan the entire time he was out of the house, which was backed up by his phone records, meant that it couldn't have been him. He was cleared from the investigation. Steve gave the police the name Ron Shockets as a possible suspect in his eyes. Ron was dating Danielle's mother and was at the house at the same time as Carly. In addition, Steve told police that while looking for Carly, he had noticed a red truck on B Ridge Road. Steve noticed what he believed to be the same truck parked up on Danielle's drive. That truck belonged to Ron. However, Ron claimed he was driving his truck on Bee Ridge Road searching for Carly when Steve saw it. But at the time Carly actually vanished, as proven by the CCTV, Ron was at work. An alibi that proved to be solid. He too was cleared from the investigation at this time. Detectives returned to the CCTV footage. The reality of digital forensics are a long way from what you see on CSI. Noise can be removed and the image can be slightly improved. You can zoom in on footage, but if the data isn't there, then enlarging it will just enlarge the pixels, not make it clearer. Whilst working on the footage, they noticed the man that was seen with Carly was wearing a jumpsuit that had a name tag on it. However, the tag couldn't be read, even on the improved footage. However, a man wearing a jumpsuit with a name tag was still useful information. With the CCTV footage being widely shown to the public, a hotline was set up in the hope to identify the man. The line quickly amassed over 700 tips. However, it would be one call in particular that would crack this case wide open. On February the 3rd, a man phoned a line and believed he knew the man, and knew him well. He could tell it was him by the uniform, and by the way that he walked. He was his business partner, a man named Joseph Smith. Police looked into Joseph Smith's background and discovered that he had a long history of convictions running right back to 1993. They discovered he was 37 years old, he had three kids and worked as a mechanic, hence the jumpsuit. In an attempt to further link him to Carly's vanishing, Joseph's car was identified as a brown coloured Lincoln. The CCTV footage was then combed for any sign of his car, but to no avail. Instead, they saw a light tan-coloured station wagon on the video at 6.18pm, just three minutes before Carly was taken. The licence plate was frustratingly unreadable on the low-quality security footage. This could not be linked to Joseph. 
Joseph was still a person of interest, so police went to his home to question him. He said that he had nothing to do with Carly's disappearance and was watching the Super Bowl at home, something he claimed that his landlord, Mimi Pincus, could verify. When questioned on it, Mimi did indeed verify that Joseph was at home at that time. When police showed him the image of him from the CCTV footage, Joseph admitted that it did look like him, but that it actually wasn't. Also revealed at this time was that Joseph was currently on probation. After police searched his car, they found illicit substances. This violated his parole conditions. Joseph Smith was arrested. Around 7 o'clock that same day, a man entered the police station to speak with them. He was Joseph's other landlord and went by the name Jeff Pincus. Jeff owned a light-coloured Buick station wagon that he had lent to Joseph the day before Carly vanished. Jeff realised that Mimi had gotten her dates mixed up when she gave her alibi for Joseph. According to Jeff, Joseph left that day at 3pm and didn't return the car until Monday morning. Jeff said that when Joseph returned the car, he could tell something strange had happened in there. All of the seats had been moved, with the back seats being down. Items that were in the car weren't where they normally would be. Jeff also said he saw the news reports about Carly's case, and he too identified Joseph as the man in the footage. This was enough for police to bring Joseph Smith in for an official interview. I want to just talk. You and I have some things to talk about. Okay, because some of the things at the house, we got to get straight. That's the most important thing. Okay. In this room, is about the truth. Mm-hmm. Okay, it's the most important thing that goes on in this room. You know, I was already that. advised to talk to a lawyer. Joseph didn't give anything to the police. Instead, he asked to speak to a lawyer. The interview was over as quickly as it began. With Joseph back in jail due to his probation violation, his only lifeline to the outside world was a jail phone. He used it to call his brother, John. John, knowing his brother well, offered to help authorities to drag a confession out of his brother. He believed he would never confess directly to the police. On this phone call, Joseph shockingly confessed to everything. Police now had all the information that they needed. Brother John also confirmed that the person seen on CCTV did appear to be Joseph Smith. The search for Carly was over. Police believe that this is what happened that day. Joseph took the tan coloured Buick and went for a drive. He took a mixture of different illicit substances, at which point he saw Carly making her 20 minute walk home from the sleepover. He saw Carly as an opportunity to take what he wanted. He grabbed her by the arm and led her to the borrowed car. There she was struck multiple times. She was R-worded in what was described to his brother sickeningly as rough s**t. He then ended her and disposed of her. She was found 2.8 miles from the car wash where she was last seen, in the woods off Proctor Road behind a church, lying face up, only semi-clothed with multiple markings. Joseph's DNA and hair fibres were also found on Carly. The case against him was undeniable. The case went to trial in 2005. John, Joseph's own brother, gave testimony against him, revealing the phone call and the fact that he recognised him from the CCTV footage. The jury took five hours to pour over the evidence, the surveillance video, the letter that Smith sent to his brother, and the recorded conversations between Smith and his mother where he admitted her. Hi, Joe. The best thing that, the best thing that you could do is just try and explain it was an accident. Mom, it was an accident, Mom. I know that, Joe. You don't think that I would do that on purpose, Mom. You no. Know Joseph Smith was convicted of first-degree murder, crimes against a child, and kidnapping on October the 24th, 2005. We, the jury, find as follows as to count one of the charges. The defendant is guilty of murder in the first degree as charged. He was sentenced to the death penalty after receiving a 10-2 vote from the jury. I lost one of the most precious things to me in my life. Because of an animal, a disgusting, perverted animal. However, the death sentence for Joseph was overturned on July the 18th, 2017. A new law was passed requiring a unanimous verdict from the jury in order to carry out the sentence. A new sentencing hearing was scheduled, but it was postponed. Disturbingly, Brother John Smith believes Joseph had committed a similar crime in the year 2000, the case of Tara Riley in Bradenton, Florida, 
who was discovered behind a Walmart. That case, however, has never been officially solved. Sadly, Carly's mother passed away in 2017 following a long battle with addiction. Joseph Smith never met his punishment. He passed away in July 2021. Do you think the punishment fits the crime here? Would you like me to investigate the Tara Riley case? Let me know down in the comments. Join the Dark Case family by hitting subscribe now and turning on notifications. Like the video to boost the signal of this case. Thank you to all my patrons. Rachel David, Kathy Green, David James, Addy Alexander, Karen Jones, El Palneri, James Harrington, Shane Woodward, Faster River, Stacey Crogerus, Summer Chambers, Mona Corona, Cepheid Variable, Anthony Watson and Jeremy Sebrenek. Be careful out there and I'll see you soon.